Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We're delighted to have you back with us again this week as we continue our study of the three angels message, one of the most significant messages that you will find in the Bible and certainly one of them that most especially applies to our day. This is week number two. We are going to be looking at a moment of destiny. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we want to thank you for bringing us together again this week as we continue our study of this incredible series of messages. We ask that you'll bless our time together today, that we may understand it better and apply it to our lives in a very significant and meaningful way. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, our guest this week, just like last week and for the remainder of the 13 weeks, is Pastor Mark Finley. He's an international speaker and evangelist. Pastor Mark, we're delighted that you could join us again this week. I'm happy to be back with It Is Written. You know, spent 14 happy years uh, here at the ministry and have such regard for John, for you, Eric, and uh, we are just delighted. Thank you for the privilege. We've got a big topic we're looking at this week. We are looking at a moment of destiny. And, and as I just mentioned, this is part of a 13 week journey that we're going on with you. Uh, learning more about this significant series of messages. Now, we mentioned the last week that uh, the book of Revelation is divided into three major parts. Can you review that with us just a little bit? Sure. If you look at Revelation, we have three major parts in the entire book and then three major parts in Revelation 14 as well. In Revelation, you have an introduction in the first chapter with, that introduces Jesus as the the divine Son of God. Christ is the one who's going to return. Jesus is the one who is present with us today as our high priest. So you, you have that introduction in chapter one. Then you have sequences of seven from about chapter two to chapter 11. You have the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets. That would be the second part. Then from 12 to 22, you have that third section that really deals with end time events. When you come to Revelation chapter 14, it is also divided into three sections. Revelation 14 is our special study during our Sabbath school time. Verses 1 to 5 talk about the 144,000, a group of people who stand on the sea of glass. Now, this may seem strange for modern uh, interpreters of the Bible or modern readers of the Bible, but it's really not strange at all when you come to the ancient times. Often the ancients gave you the conclusion before they gave you what led up to the conclusion. So you have that, uh, Pastor Eric, in Revelation 14. The first part is verses 1 to 5, where you, you see this scene with the people on the Sea of Glass, the people that are with the Lamb, with Jesus Christ. Then you have the message that prepares them for that event, Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Then you have the event for which they're prepared. Revelation chapter 14, verse 14 to 20. So you have one to five, Revelation 14, one to five, a people. Revelation chapter 14, six to 12, a message. Revelation chapter 14, verses uh, 14 to 20, an event. And that kind of summarizes the entire chapter of 14. So we've got the, the threes in several different places. We've got a summary of, of chapter 14. Why, why is it here? I mean, if we, if we were to look at where we stand in, in the scheme of Earth's history, we are today living in Revelation chapter 14. We see the people, we see the message. Uh, what's, why is it there? What's the purpose of it? Revelation chapter 14 is to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. There is no chapter in the Bible that is as definitive and as clear in a message to prepare people for the coming of Jesus as Revelation chapter 14. As we look back through history, we see that when God has had a major event to impact the world, he has always had a message to prepare for that event. As it says, for example, in Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Before the destruction of the world by fire, God sent, rather by water, <laughs> God sent Noah to prepare for the flood, 120 years he preached. 
before John the before Jesus came, John the Baptist was raised up by God to prepare a message for the first coming of Christ. And when the world is going to be destroyed at the end time and God's going to come to deliver his people, he has sent a message to prepare us. In Revelation chapter 14, pastor is given to us in love. It's a message that is saturated in love to prepare a people for the return of Jesus Christ. So Revelation 14, a message of love, I think that's significant because a lot of times you'll run into people, and I know we'll get into this a little bit later uh, in more depth, who say, you know, especially the book of Revelation is, is a book filled with fear and, and we're worried about this, this vengeful God and so forth, and we don't want to jump too far into that. But this is a message of love, isn't it? It really is. You know, I had an interesting experience many years ago. We were living in Hinsdale, Illinois. My wife took our son to the barber, and he was just a young lad, you know, five years old. And she came back and said to me, Mark, you got to go to your haircut. I said, what are you talking about? My hair looks pretty good. She said, no, that barber is really interested in spiritual things. She said, just before our son was going to go get his haircut, there was a man sitting in the barber chair reading the paper. And as the man read the paper, he said, boy, everything in the paper is scary. Everything in the paper is scary. He said, you read about war, you read about crime. It's scary to read the paper. And the barber said to him, you think that's scary, you should read the book of Revelation. <laughs> he said, last night I read the book of Revelation, all about these beasts and the mark of the beast and, and, and war conflict. And uh, he said, I could hardly sleep. My wife said, you've got to go help that barber, go get a haircut. So I went down and uh, sat there and I prayed, Lord, help me to know what to do. And I picked up the newspaper as I sat in the barber's chair and I said, boy, you know what, sir? Everything you read in the newspaper is scary. <laughs> and the barber said, you think that's scary? He took the bait, you know, he said, you should read Revelation. I said, I read it a little bit. We talked about Jesus, the Lamb of God in Revelation. We talked about a loving God who wants to prepare people for the coming of Christ. We talked about the return of Jesus. And uh, this barber and I began Bible studies, and we eventually baptized him. Oh, wow. So Revelation, you mentioned scary. It's only scary if you don't see the central theme of Revelation. And you remember last week we talked about the theme of Revelation, chapter 1, Jesus wins, Satan loses. So the theme of the book of Revelation is the all-conquering, triumphant Christ. Jesus triumphed over the principalities in hell, in his life on earth as he defeated Satan when Satan tempted him in the wilderness and throughout his life. Jesus defeated the principalities and powers of hell on the cross when he provided salvation for humanity. Jesus is defeating the principalities and powers of hell now as his high priest ministry in the sanctuary. And Jesus will defeat the principalities and powers of hell when he comes again in the cause of glory. That's the theme of Revelation. So less a theme of worry and fear more one of hope and encouragement. Exactly. And that's, and that's phenomenal. You were in Revelation chapter 14 this week. You mentioned the, the several portions of it, three different portions of it here. Uh, one section, chapter, chapter 14, verses 14 through 20, talks about some harvests. Unpack those harvests a little bit for us, if you would. There are two harvests there, and let me just read through Revelation 14. And um, we're going to take a look at some amazing things. You know, when I prepared these Sabbath school lessons, you think you know a great deal about something until you start studying it in depth. I would always talk about the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, but actually there are six angels in Revelation 14. And so let me just read through it. If you have your Bible and you are watching the program, get out your Bible, get out a pen and uh, underline some passages and uh, take some notes. So here we go. Revelation 14, verse 14. John says, then I looked. Well, why do you have then there? Because it's after the message that prepares, and we're going to go into that message in depth in future lessons. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man. Why is it that when Jesus is mentioned here in Revelation chapter 14, he's mentioned as the Son of Man? It's the favorite title that Jesus had. John, who wrote the Gospel of John, is writing Revelation. And he wants us to know that the one that walked the dusty streets of Galilee, 
the one that walked the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem, the one that touched the eyes of the blind and they were opened, and the ears of the deaf and they were unstopped, the one that touched withered hands, the one that, that healed the sick, and the one that ministered love and raised the dead, and the one that forgave sins and delivered the demoniacs with power, the Son of Man, the one that identifies with us, he is the one that's coming again to redeem us and save us. It says he has a, on his head a golden crown. This crown is Stephanos. It, it, it is the crown of victory. It's the victor's crown. So Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, comes with the victor's crown. In his hand is a sharp sickle. That is to say that he comes to reap the harvest. It says, and another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now look, when I read this, I just stood back, and uh, I hadn't seen it before, Pastor Eric. It says, another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. So you, here you have Jesus, he's ready to come. And an angel comes from the presence of God with the iridescent glory of God. And he says, Jesus, the time is ripe. Jesus, the time is ripe. Go, deliver your people. And uh, the harvest is ripe. Those who are righteous have made their final irrevocable decision. Nothing can move them. Those that are wicked and unrighteous have made their final irrevocable decision. Nothing can move them. Both harvests have come to bear. The time is ripe. And then it says, thrust in your sickle, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. What does it mean that the harvest of the earth was reaped? What is this harvest? If you go back to Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29, Mark 4, verse 26 to 29, you notice what the harvest is all about. And here, it's the parable of the growing seed. Matthew, ch Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 29. Pastor, do you want to read those for us? Sure. Mark 4, starting in verse 26. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night and rise by day. And the seed should sprout and grow, he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So the seed, of course, represents the Word of God. So since Jesus' death in resurrection and ascension, the disciples went out and spread the Word of God to the world. Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, then the end shall come. So the, the maturing of the gospel seed takes place when every living human being has had an opportunity to accept or reject the gospel. And we are seeing that today through television, through the internet, through social media, through the printed page, through preachers. We are living in the time of the fulfillment of the harvest. Uh, and that's encouraging. If that doesn't encourage you, I don't know what could. But we're going to come back in just a moment and continue looking at these two harvests and the depth of Revelation chapter 14. But if you're enjoying this study of Revelation 14 and you want to get more out of it, I want to encourage you to pick up this book called Three Cosmic Messages by Pastor Mark Finley. This book will give you greater depth, deeper insight into what we are studying and add an immense value to your understanding of the three angels' messages. To pick that up, you can go to itiswritten.shop. Again, that's itiswritten.shop and look for the book, Three Cosmic Messages by Mark Finley. We're going to come back in just a moment as we continue looking at a moment of destiny. We'll be right back. It's everywhere, adorning churches, adorning people. There's a season every year commemorating the cross. But beyond eggs and rabbits, there's a power, the power of a sacrifice, the power of the love of God. Be sure you see At The Cross and learn about the single event that changed the course of history, the event that can change your life forever. Predicted by prophets and foretold by Jesus Himself, what happened at the cross was a demonstration of God's love like no other. 
Humanity's fall into sin in the Garden of Eden brought upon Adam and Eve and their descendants inescapable consequences. But into that turmoil stepped Jesus, promising the planet a way of escape. Don't miss At the Cross, brought to you by It Is Written TV. Welcome back to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. We're taking a look at lesson number two, A Moment of Destiny. Now, Pastor Mark, a moment ago, you were mentioning from, uh, from Wednesday's lesson, the victor's crown, that's Stephanos. There's an interesting quote in the middle of Wednesday's lesson uh, that comes from a book called Christ's Object Lessons on pages 65 and 66. It's a powerful quote. And part of it says, the plant must either grow or die. As its growth is silent and imperceptible, but continuous, so is the development of the Christian life. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect, yet if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. That's a, it's an interesting statement. It's a very profound statement. And one that I think a lot of people, even a lot of Christians, don't quite understand. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Open it up for us. Sure. I'm interested in this particular sentence. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect. Yet, if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there'll be continual advancement. There are many people that have the idea that perfection is a state that we arrive at, and that if we arrive at that state, there's no more growth. But yet, this statement says that uh, at every stage we may be perfect and there's continual advancement. So how do you harmonize those two? To, it's a definition of perfection. In this context and in the Bible, what is perfection? Perfection is total commitment. Perfection has to do with my commitment to Christ first. So when, as the Holy Spirit touches my heart and I make a decision to follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit then works in my life to lead me to a commitment to Christ. Now, I can only commit the things that I know. So, as it says in John chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus said, I do all the, those things that please him. So, what is perfection? Perfection is the desire in every aspect of my life to please Jesus. But the more I study and grow, the more the seed of the Word of God is developed within me, the more I see things in my life that I've never seen before. I may recognize that I've had a critical tongue. I may recognize that there's pride. I may recognize that there is in my life um, times when I'm not 100% honest in the statements that I make. As I recognize those and am convicted by the Holy Spirit because all I want to do is please Jesus, I surrender those things. So perfection is not a state that we enter into it's rather an attitude of commitment to Christ. And in that attitude of commitment, there is constant growth as Jesus is revealing to me things in my life that are not in harmony with his will. So this involves a, a word that a lot of times people don't want to come up against, and that's surrender. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to completely surrender our wills to him. And, and as you mentioned, he continues to reveal things to us that we then have the opportunity to either surrender or, or not to surrender. Uh, I think I had somebody share it with me this way. The, the closer we get to the light, that is Jesus, the closer we get to know him, the more distinct becomes our own shadow. Mm -hmm. We realize how, how far we fall from, from him. But by his grace, we continue to grow uh, and make advancement day by day. And when we come to this final harvest, and that, that's exactly right, we come to this final harvest, you know, in Philippians 1, it says that he that has begun a good work in you is going to finish it. Um, in Hebrews 12, it says God is the, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So what we believe is this, that right now I'm not everything that God wants me to be, but he's working in my life through his Holy Spirit because I want my will, I've surrendered my will totally to him. Do I know how God himself is going to bring me to the state of final harvest where he could say it's finished in my life? I don't know how that's going to be accomplished but it's accomplished by faith, faith in the Christ that redeemed me, faith in the grace that is working in my life now, faith in the belief that through the intercession of Jesus, he's going to get me to where I want me to, he wants me to be. And I like this illustration. 
When I was just a young boy, seven years old, I went to school. I was in first grade. I didn't know that when I was in college, I would be taking um, Greek, for example, my theology. I, I didn't know that I would be studying various aspects of philosophy. I didn't even know how to read back then in the first grade. No, I was just learning to read. But I stayed in school, and my teachers prepared me for what I didn't know I could be. Um, if a child goes in the first grade and they're lear learning one and one is two and two and two is four and, and three and three is six, they don't know that one day they're going to take trigonometry. They don't know one day they'll take calculus. They don't know that one day they'll be a famous scientist. But if they stay in school and allow the teacher to teach them, they're going to come to that state. It's like that in the Christian life. We are committed to stay in the school of Christ, who will work in our life and finish what he has started and bring us to that final harvest so that we're ready for his coming. And that continual advancement is, is a part of that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So this, this harvest that you mentioned, uh, we mentioned that there were two different harvests. We've kind of delved into one of the harvests. What about that, the other harvest? The other harvest, let's read about it here. Um, the other harvest is called the harvest of grapes, the grapes of wrath. It's in Revelation 14, verse 17 to 20. It says, Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. So this is another reaping that takes place. We had first the reaping of golden grain, now the reaping of gory grapes. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire, and he cried with a, cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, so you have another angel coming out, thrust in your sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it under the winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles, about 1,600 furlongs. So let's try to unpack that first. The purpose of the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, that begins with the statement, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The purpose of the gospel is to provide salvation and redemption and freedom from the condemnation and guilt of sin and the power and dominion of sin for every human being. So when you come to the final two harvests in Revelation chapter 14, every human being has, on earth has had a reasonable opportunity to accept or reject Christ, to accept or reject his last day message. In the last days of earth's history, when the final climax comes, God himself will pour out his Holy Spirit to give everybody that opportunity. Nobody is lost because they didn't know. They will only be lost because of what they knew and didn't do. They didn't take advantage of the opportunity. And there was rebellion in the heart. There was self-centeredness and egotism and pride, which led to Satan's fall, of course. So the final harvest of gory grapes is the harvest of the lost. It's like Revelation 22 says, and maybe we should turn to that. Jesus is coming with his reward. So the, har the final decisions take place just before the uh, coming of Jesus. And if you can look there and maybe read for us Revelation 22, and we're going to look there. Uh, it talks about Christ coming, and he's coming quickly. Revelation 22, we're going to start with verse uh, 10 and read, go ahead and read 10 to 12, Pastor. It says, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every one according to his work. So here we have very clearly two classes that are developed, the righteous and the unrighteous, the, the holy and the unholy, the uh, filthy and the clean. And it says that though every human being will make that decision and then Jesus will come to give out his reward. 
human probation does not close because Christ's love or mercy or grace has run out. It only closes because everybody has already made their decision. And if, if people would have had further opportunity to make a decision for Christ, he would have kept the door of mercy open. So we never have to worry, Pastor Eric, that um, sometime the door of mercy is going to be shut and I may want to be saved, but I can't. That's not true at all. God's grace is there. God's mercy is there. God's goodness is there. But the door of mercy will shut because everybody has already made their decision. They've made their, they've decided, and keeping the door of mercy open wouldn't make any difference at all. Two significant and very different harvests, one that you would want to be a part of and one that you absolutely would not want to be a part of. Uh, And the Bible makes that very, very clear. Speaking of contrasts, we just have a couple of minutes left here. What other contrasts do we see in the book of Revelation? Two significantly different harvests. What else do we see in the book of Revelation? In Revelation, we see two leaders, the lamb and the dragon. We see two signs, the seal of God and the mark of the beast. We see two women, the woman in white, uh, pure, true church, the woman in scarlet, the false church system. We see the two classes, the righteous and the unrighteous. We see two cities, Babylon, the city of confusion, Jerusalem, the city of truth, and we see these two harvests. And really the appeal of this particular chapter is an appeal to your heart and mine. The appeal of this lesson is the appeal to make daily decisions prompted by the Holy Spirit to have Christ's grace fill our hearts and change our lives. The appeal is to be in the harvest of golden grain and not the harvest of gory grapes. The Spirit of God works in our hearts to lead us to Jesus, to accept his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy, and his power in our lives. Grace delivers us from the guilt of the past and the power of sin in the present. So the good news is you and I have an opportunity. We have an opportunity and a privilege to be in the right harvest. And that's why the book of Revelation and especially Revelation chapter 14 is given to us to prepare us for the return of Jesus. And one of the best ways that you can prepare is to get to know him personally yourself. The more time you spend in his word, the more time you spend with him in prayer, the more time you allow his spirit to work on your heart and choose not to resist the moving of the Holy Spirit, the closer you are to the return of Jesus, being ready for it. And that's something we all want to be ready for. Thank you again for joining us this week. Pastor Mark, thank you for joining us again this week. Thank you, Pastor. And we've got 11 more weeks, 11 more lessons to go. So we will look forward to seeing you again next week on Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written.